everything you need to know so far on Equifax getting hacked, an Android Toast notification vulnerability affects almost all Android phones, and that Linux shell built into Windows 10 could hide malware. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings! I am Shannon Morris and this is ThreatWire for September 12, 2017, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. If you have not checked out our Patreon yet, please do so. We have lots that we want to do for this show, but we can't do it without your support. Check out the page over at patreon.com slash threatwire. That's the place to support the show. On to the news. First off, Equifax is one of the three largest consumer credit reporting firms in the United States. Last week, they publicly disclosed a breach of data that affected 143 million people, which equates to 44% of the U.S. population. Data exposed includes names, social security numbers, birth dates, addresses, along with some credit card numbers, uh, 209,000 to be exact, and driver's licenses for some, along with dispute documents for around 182,000 people. This breach also includes data on some UK and Canadian residents as well. The hack occurred from mid-May to July of 2017, with it being discovered on July 29th, and then them going public about it on September 7th, which was Thursday. The exploit used was via a US website application vulnerability, but no other information was given via Equifax's postings about the incident and how it happened technically. Equifax has offered free credit monitoring through their product, which is called Trust ID, for one year for affected customers and advise signing up on their third-party domain to find out if you were affected or not. Unfortunately, though, the third-party site called EquifaxSecurity2017.com was not entirely forthcoming on whether or not you were included and has tons of its own complications. So for starters, when the news originally dropped on Thursday, some customers who visited the site were not able to determine if they were affected or not. The site would either say you weren't affected or it would give you this vague message that said, thank you, your enrollment date is with a date. It did not clarify if you were actually a part of the hack or not. Second, Equifax's terms of service included wording that made it sound like you had no right to a class action lawsuit if signing up. This has been clarified in writing since and now says that it doesn't apply to the cybersecurity incident. Also, EquifaxSecurity2017.com was being flagged on some browsers early on as a phishing threat. Some customers were seeing random results. They would be told that they were not affected, only to check on another browser and see that they were affected. According to ZDNet writer Zach Whitaker, using test and 123456 as your last name and the last six of your social security number on the site, the page would say that you were affected. This is not necessarily surprising if they use that information in testing the site before it went live and they simply left it there in the code, for example. Other folks tried random names with real actual social security numbers and they got varying results. Some said they were affected, some did not. Unfortunately though, if it is randomly telling people to sign up, they could mean that they are trying to churn out a profit through Trust ID, even if you weren't affected. Another security researcher posits that when creating a credit freeze on Equifax, the 10 digit code, a PIN distributed upon signing up, is just a timestamp of when you made the freeze. Equifax has stated on their site that the numbers are randomly generated, but in an article for Ars Technica, they also said, and I quote, we are engaged in a process that will provide consumers a randomly generated PIN. We expect this change to be effective when Within 24 hours, a consumer has an option and will continue to have an option to change an existing PIN. The requested new PIN is sent to the consumer via US mail to their address of record, and that was on September 11th. Furthermore, and a slight tangent, Bloomberg reported on Thursday that three senior executives sold shares worth $1.8 million total just days after the company stated they discovered the vulnerability. According to Equifax, the executives were not aware of the incident at the time. If the date of discovery is July 29th and the selling dates were August 1st and August 2nd, it definitely is very, very suspicious timing, even if coincidence. According to the Securities and Exchange Commission, trading while in possession of material information not yet public 
is a huge no-no. Krebs on Security has also reported that sites were registered days before the announcement, such as one called equahacks.com, by an employee at Mandiant Security, potentially to swipe up any sites that could be used to fish victims in the coming days. The company has stopped the hack, but is working with authorities to find out who was behind it. Alleged hackers did create a dark website claiming to have the info and stating that they would post it on September 15th, unless Equifax paid them 600 Bitcoin, which equates to two. 0.5 million US dollars, but this site also seems to be just a scam. Equifax is facing a class action lawsuit already for the hack in a federal court in Portland, Oregon for $70 billion in damages. How much is that per person after legal fees? It turns out it's a little less than 500 bucks. Yeah, so that basically means your social security number and all that personal identifying information is worth around $480 or so. What? Really? So what can you do now that your data, if you are a US citizen, was potentially in this hack, or even if you were in the UK or Canada, you can enroll in Trust ID through Equifax's site, which is free whether or not the site says that you were actually affected. This will give you access to copies of your credit report, it lets you lock your report, it provides credit reports from Experian and TransUnion as well, it also provides online scanning for your social security number and includes identity theft insurance. Whether or not you were totally ticked about the way that they are handling this hack, Equifax is free monitoring. It's it's a good deal. Equifax has also said that they don't require auto pay for re-enrollment at the end of that one year, but you could always do so if you felt inclined to purchase it at that time. The next thing you can do is check all of those credit reports for any kind of fishy activity and then freeze your credit with all three major bureaus. We actually talked about how to freeze your credit reports on my show Tech Thing, which I do with Patrick Norton over at youtube.com slash techthing. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. We do tons of geeky tech reviews over there as well as talk about some security too for consumers. It's super fun. The link is down over in the show notes to that episode specifically as well as the timestamp. Lastly, you can also set up a fraud alert and the FTC website has info on how to do that. So that is linked below too. Also, use good internet hygiene. That means don't click on weird links, even if they look legit. Use different passwords for all your different websites. Use different security questions and answers. Make up answers for, I mean, that's what I do. Use two-factor authentication and file your taxes early next year so somebody else doesn't get to them when you should be filing them. Lastly, if you are a victim of identity theft, go over to identitytheft.gov slash assistant to report it and get help. Link to all of that is also in the show notes. Technically, if you were a victim of identity theft, you can also change your social security number, but it's still tied to the original and it's very tough to do. You have to go in person to the office, yada, yada, yada. So I don't know if you would do that or not. So what do you think that we should do about social security numbers yourself? They have been used to verify identities for decades now, but given that they are basically leaked by one hack or another, should they continue to be used in this matter? I have read the history of social security numbers don't worry you don't need to tell me about it in the comments I already know about it I'm not going to go into details here but you can look up the history for yourselves I am asking about the future so what are your thoughts tell them below in the comments Researchers at Palo Alto Networks posted on Thursday about a vulnerability that affects all Android phones up to Android Oreo, which is the newest form of the Android operating system that was released just weeks ago. Patches are available via the September 2017 Android Security Bulletin. An attack could use what is called an overlay attack to gain control of the phone, lock it, or steal information from it. Explained in the blog post, this attack can occur when an application draws a window over other apps on the device, which could trick a user into clicking on something when they think they're actually clicking on something entirely else. Now you could then download malware and you could end up getting owned. Overlay attacks are not new, they definitely aren't, we've seen them before, but being able to circumvent all the mitigation techniques is definitely new. This specific overlay attack uses the toast notification pop-up and it doesn't require permissions to run, it just automatically runs on most Android operating systems. It will simply work if a malware-ridden application is installed on the device. Researchers say that it has not been used in the wild. Unfortunately though, unless you have a phone directly from Google, you will have to wait for your carrier to push a patch for the vulnerability. Microsoft announced a while back that you can now use Linux applications in Windows 10 without the need for virtualization. Yay! This is great for developers, and it has come in handy for us given that we use Windows for editing in Adobe Premiere Pro, and we 
often work as well in the Linux shell to test products and stuff like that. Well, researchers from Checkpoint Software Technologies discovered that they could create malware that was undetectable on Windows 10 by working inside the Linux CLI using Bash. And of course, they named it Bashware, the malware bypass leading antivirus software suites, and it runs in the Windows subsystem for Linux or WSL for short. It tricks varying Linux apps into thinking that they are communicating with the Linux kernel instead of communicating with the WSL, which works with the Windows kernel. Now, to work, a user would need to have their computer in development mode, and WSL would need to be enabled. Bashware could automatically enable WSL, though, and then download the programs needed. Unfortunately, no antivirus currently checks these Linux processes, though, through WSL, uh, through their programming interface, which is named Pico API to coincide with the Pico processes that these run on, that those Linux ones are running on. According to Microsoft, the problem is low risk since it requires the user to enable development mode. Bashware could also be used if an attacker was able to change a few registry keys on a Windows 10 machine, which could also turn on dev mode. So yeah, there's a lot of workarounds here. The malware would not need to be Linux only. Using Wine, it could also be a Windows malware that's already been used in the wild, and it could still be hitting because the antivirus does not check Pico APIs. Luckily, you are probably okay if you use that good internet hygiene I spoke of and you don't have dev mode turned on, as it would require some previous attack that already hacked your machine to work. Thank you again to all the wonderful people out there who contribute to patreon.com slash threatwire. You are the reason that we can keep bringing you news every single week and any little bit helps us grow the show. And in return, you will get access to a bunch of extras on Patreon, including an audio only RSS feed and my own fur baby photos, which which I love to share with everyone. So thank you so much for contributing. We might even feature your fur baby like these two new ones in an upcoming episode. Check out the perk levels and our goals too to see everything that we're trying to do. And thank you again to, for helping us keep this show completely independent and ad free. And of course, if you cannot donate, hit that subscribe button, hit that share button, share it on your favorite social media and use the hashtag ThreatWire. And with that, I'm Shannon Morse and I will see you on the internet. Thank <laughs> you.